Hello everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Bethany and I'm with the NC Serials Conference Planning Committee. You are in session 4B. This is the last session of the day. So thank you for sticking around for the conference today and I, ho I hope you've had a wonderful experience. Uh, we've got two presentations in this session. So we're going to go ahead and get started, get through the presentations and save time for questions and answers at the end. So to start, we will have Erica Boardman. Thank you, Bethany. Let me go ahead and get the screen shared. Can everyone see that already? Yes, thank you. Perfect. OK. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Erica Boardman. I am the Electronic Resources Management Librarian um, at the UNC Charlotte Atkins Library. And today I'm going to give a brief overview of a recent project completed this past fall that involved working with counter usage, the Sushi protocol, and all my analytics. I hope to share some of my own personal insights and experiences with the project. So this project, oh, we have a little closed captioning thing go away there we go this project was created for my mlis capstone and the overall goal was to see what all my analytics could do with counter use statistics what type of reports can be made what works and what doesn't work and so on the final products included workflows for analytics recommendations for optimizing counter usage in sushi and alma and actual counter usage reports created in analytics that could be reused over time um, for the project, the previous ERM librarian provided me with three common use cases that usage data is used for at Atkins Library, and that included journal package analysis, reporting stats such as iPads and for Acerol, and for analyzing cost per use of current subscriptions. Um, these use cases were the quote unquote like end goals to accomplish with analytics at the end of the project. Um, the three main parts of the project included preparing and organizing the data in Alma, creating the documentation, and then, of course, working in Alma Analytics. Come on, here we go. So uh, before I could get started in analytics, I needed to make sure that our counter reports and sushi accounts were working and set up the way that they should. For the purpose of this presentation, I will be speaking more on the counter metrics that we use at Atkins. Um, I have them listed here. We work with the TRJ1 journal requests, um, TRB1 book requests, and then of course we have our database metrics. The reports that are bolded and have a star next to them are the preferred usage metrics for e-resource valuation with us, and the other ones are just there and used to supplement resources that don't provide that preferred metric. Um, and we do have some vendors that have the IRM1 multimedia item requests um, harvested into the Sushi accounts, but it's not a significant amount. So we're not going to touch too much on that in this presentation. So with preparing and organizing the data, I needed to work on setting up and troubleshooting the Sushi accounts first. Um, for the most part, I mostly just troubleshooted existing ones that weren't properly harvesting usage data, but I did get the chance to set up Sushi accounts for vendors who just recently started supporting Sushi harvesting. Um, Alma does have a Sushi vendors list that they do try to keep updated, um, and they sometimes will provide um, those updates. They don't email them out or anything, but you can always double check like on a periodical basis. One thing to note about the sushi setup is the harvesting schedule, which is what this little screenshot is down here. It's in the Alma configuration. Um, you can change what day of the month you want sushi to harvest your usage data. There aren't many options, but you can choose between having it scheduled for the 4th, 11th, 18th, or the 25th day of the month. Originally, our library had it set up for the 4th, but I opted to change it to the 11th because it wasn't uncommon for sushi to harvest reports by our vendors and they weren't yet available. Um, by pushing it back to the 11th, most of the reports that we have getting harvested are coming through with no errors or messages stating that usage wasn't ready yet. And it keeps the kind of the vendor accounts clean and the usage tab clean instead of having all of these miscellaneous reports that didn't harvest yet. Um, determining the proper counter reports was an important part. As I worked through each vendor account and their sushi accounts, I also wanted to know if the reports we already had set up were actually necessary to have or if there was a better option. We originally had the DRD1 reports used for database usage, which 
um, had the investigations of requests, but we wanted to use unique item investigations into the analysis, but that's only provided in the DR master. So to keep things consistent and clean, I went through and removed all of the DR D1 use reports from the vendor accounts and from the sushi accounts and replaced it with the DR master and submitted a new harvesting request. Um, I did this mostly for the analytics part. Um, by removing all of those reports and just reharvesting everything with the new master report, I was able to make our analytics reports only include the DR master report, like that specific report, instead of having to pick and choose, um, oh, I want the DR master. I also want the DR D1. We just, I could only just have the master report of all of our database usage instead of having to pick and choose too many different metrics. Um, then it was the concept of sushi or no sushi. In other cases, there were some vendors that we had that didn't need to have sushi set up under their vendor account because the usage for that particular vendor was appearing under another content provider. So Highwire, for instance, they provide um, usage data for, they did at the time at least for um, AACR for American Cancer and then BMJ and um, Cold Harbor, they ha had a few of theirs. Um, but they do also have their own sushi accounts, their own counter reports that you could pull from their portals, but we don't want to double pull. So it's good to keep in mind if you do go in and set up sushi, like taking into account um, if you have vendors that you already have in Alma that are also already providing usage data for other publishers and not. And then we had to go in and clean up the usage data. I'd already mentioned that a little bit. Um, removing duplicates and overlapping reports is a big thing. Some reports were uploaded or harvested twice, causing some overlap. And then we have released four reports at the time. So we wanted to make sure that we were using release five as much as we possibly could. And then if we were going to use release four, that we were comparing it properly or we were just focusing on it at once. Not every release four metric is comparable to R5. And that was important to keep in mind. Um, going through and harvesting missing data, I noticed there were some gaps in usage. In some instances, it was deliberate. The vendor didn't have the usage ready um, or it was too late to retrieve it based off of a certain time frame that that usage data is available from the vendor. Um, so I went through and made sure that everything was kind of cohesively being moved forward. We had the full gaps of the time frame. Um, took a lot of cross checking and a lot of um, kind of backwards um, parts of the project, back stepping in the project. And then finally, switching out the R4 with the R5 reports, there were a lot of R, like release four reports for JR1s. And now that we had the TRG1s for a particular vendor, it was time that we could just switch those release four reports out with those particular, um, with the TRJ1s instead of having to keep looking at both and trying to remember which one had which months. We could just completely have one set of the release five metrics. And then these are the recommendations I made regarding the cleanup and setting up process. Keep the usage data tab in the vendor's account clean. This isn't a must do type of thing, but it, keeping that data and the place that stores that data clean and organized is a better way to go about it than seeing a long list of randomly harvested usage reports that failed um, or from a random year or so on. Remove reports that failed once they have successfully been harvested and watch for duplicate harvesting. One thing that Sushi does in our Alma environment is it attempts to harvest data from November 2020 and December 2020. I haven't had the chance to reach out to Ex Libris about it, but for some reason, Alma isn't recognizing that the usage data for those two months in that particular year were manually uploaded. So Sushi continues to try and harvest those. Um, it's partially why I started the whole cleanup process in the first place. <laughs> um, then phase out re release four reports if possible. Um, our four reports are great if it's the only option, but they are not the best if you are looking to compare or combine totals from release five. Very few release four reports are directly comparable to release five, and the ones that are comparable may require extra steps that I didn't personally investigate or handle during this project, or it'll require you to do some math between the report totals. And there are some formulas um, that some websites have out there. And then determine what the needs are um, for your library and collaborate and be transparent. The counter reports I removed and replaced with a different report wasn't just a lone wolf call. I did reach out to different folks in the collection services department for their input before making that decision. Um, you wanna gauge what everyone is looking for from the usage data and what they hope to achieve with it. If there is something they are hoping to do with analytics, 
um, make sure all aspects are in place to achieve that or find an alternative to their wish list items. Um, it's okay if you can't necessarily achieve everything that they want because sometimes the Alma environment that you're working in may not be set up to accomplish something. Maybe your department for a long time hasn't been adding say list prices in for each portfolios where you're not going to probably be able to pull a cost per use if there's no available list prices in Alma. That's something that can be considered to work on in the future. And other times it's just all my analytics may not actually be able to do something. So just be honest and transparent about it. If you hit a wall, find an alternative, and then you can go back and experiment later. Creating documentation um, for, your, for your sake and the others in your department, it can be helpful to create documentation about counter usage and all my analytics. Um, Step-by-step -step workflows and follow-along tutorials can be a typical Google Doc with written out instructions or however you like to create your workflows. Um, I opted for Google Slides PowerPoint that allows each step to be separated completely, which can create a learning experience that enforces the user to focus on one step at a time instead of reading ahead. I think that's important with all my analytics, especially. Um, you can also do a screen recording so your audience can follow along with you and create their own reports and analytics. Other like useful resources you can make, you can make an R4 to R5 crosswalk, which just gives everyone an understanding on what release four reports can be substituted with in release five, if at all. A list of counter compliant vendors, which is what this screenshot is. We have some of our vendors and I have a list of if they're R5 compliant, if we have sushi set up and what reports they're allowed. Um, you can also make notes if you ever come across any problems with harvesting. And other resources that you may think could be useful, even links to other online manuals, um, some Alma tutorials, um, straight to the counter registry, whatever you may think would benefit your department or the folks that are just gonna be working with this. Um, the takeaways here, consider your audience. If you are new at your job, it may take time for you to learn about your colleagues and how they learn best, but that's fine. You can always revamp everything later, but it's important that you consider who is going to be looking at these tutorials, who's going to be looking at the documentation and how effective it can be. Create cheat sheets and quick reference documents. It's not uncommon for me to look back at the workflows I made and realize how tremendously helpful they are, but I don't always need to see the entire start to finish workflow. Sometimes I just need a quick reminder about some small detail, which is often lost among thousands of words in the workflow that I made. So create some quick reference information, even if it's just a Google Doc or you have like a little flashcard that you keep at your desk. Um, and then stay organized. This will help you keep track of your vendors and the type of usage that they provide. You can also use a spreadsheet to add any of those vendors, um, just like the one that I just showed in the screenshot before. And it'll be helpful to those over time in the future um, to be prepared to take on helping it with like usage data per se. Um, so just stay organized. It's a good thing. Um, and then finally, working in all my analytics. Um, learning the ways of analytics took a lot more of my time. I've always worked in analytics, but this was a big learning curve. And a lot of it was spent with a lot of trial and error. I spent many long time, nights um, trying to get this done because it was a school project. I needed to get it done. It wasn't just work. Um, and it was very frustrating, but a lot of trial and error. And I remember, I think I had, I still have a huge folder of 20 plus reports that I created in analytics, just trying to manipulate different things and figure out why some things weren't working the way that I wanted. Um, and I just also keep some for reference. So just have a day where you are in the mood to be patient so you can do all that trial and error. Um, choosing appropriate fields and filters, depending on how you create your reports, you may want to filter your data a little bit to only display the information you specifically want from the report. So if you only want to see vendors that are providing journal requests, you can choose to do that. And it can make everything easier, it can shorten your report, make everything less cluttered. Um, make everything yeah make everything less cluttered filters are really great and so are prompts because it limits all the information and um, you can just pick and choose discovering the possibilities and limitations all my analytics was able to do a lot of the same things i would have done in excel or google sheets like creating a column for the average usage across three fiscal years um, however analytics may not be able to do everything we want to do with our counter data and that's okay um, one of the original goals for the project was to create a report showing counter usage for an entire, entire journal package, such as Elsevier Science Direct. However, since counter usage isn't reported at the package level, it, 
you would have to pick out each title that doesn't belong in the report. Um, and at that point, you might as well just use a VLOOKUP formula in Google Sheets or Excel. Um, maybe at some point, I believe there's a KBAR automation that's supposed to be kind of helping with this down the line um, if it's not already in place. Um, but at the time of this project, it wasn't feasible to do this. And I don't believe it still is because again, counter usage is not reported on the package level at the moment. Um, oh, no, computer. Okay. And then um, collaborating with key constituents, you want to know what type of reports that they want. So some, um, like our library, we don't really worry about uploading um, denials or turnaways, but we do pull that information. We mostly want to focus on what people are accessing and what are people downloading the most. Um, and we want to find out what they hope to achieve with analytics. Like how would all my analytics make their lives easier? Because ultimately the whole point of this project was for me to make things for everybody else to use that was effective for them. Not just for me and what I think would be fun. <laughs> um, so here's a sample report for journal usage and title count. Um, of course, I have the vendors bleeped out. This is for current subscriptions for an entire year. Um, I was able to lay out the years at the top. I have a total usage, so it combined all of them. Um, I believe it's like a calculated field. And then you can also do an average usage field. And same over here at title count. So, um, and this isn't the normal table view. This is a, a pivot table, which we will see again in a minute. Um, and back on to the same journal usage, except this one has publisher. And this is an example of what I was referring to earlier, where you might have a vendor that has multiple publishers that also produce their, produce their own usage data. And if you look in counter registry, I will see most of these publishers listed as having their own separate usage data to report, but we don't want to double count. Um, table prompts, that's what this little thing is up here where it says vendor name, vendor A. It allows you to filter your port to just looking at one vendor. If we had all of our vendors available here, all of the publishers would just be taking up an entire like page. And um, this just helps us focus on one thing at a time. Filters, if you want to make a report that is about one vendor, um, you can use Obviously, you can do that with the vendor, but I used it for the load file counter report type, which is specifying which file that I pulled specifically from counter that this is going to focus on. Um, this lets you just worry about one type, one thing at a time. Um, so we don't want to look at vendors who also have journals. We just want to see vendors that have database usage. That's what that filter is going to do. It's also good for material type indicator if you only want to look at one type of metric for databases instead of the whole shebang. And then this is the pivot table. I don't know if anyone in here has ever worked with pivot tables in Alma Analytics, but it's beautiful. Um, it's much nicer than the regular table view because everything is just lined up perfectly. Um, it allows for things to look less cluttered and it organizes the display of your data to your preferences. Um, this is a side-by-side -side, and I believe that's in the way still, there we go. Um, default table view, this is what it would, normally look like. And it's not like it's bad. It's just it's going to be a very long line. You have the usage date years going down the line. But in the pivot table, we have everything lined up neatly and everything's condensed. So it's a much better option. Oh, no, there we go. OK. Um, and then this is a journal title quick search that I created. Um, it's one of my favorite things. It's one of the things the associate dean for the department um, asked for, and I was actually able to do it. Um, we put in an ISSN number, we can filter the fiscal year month, vendor name, and what metric we want. And then it's automatically going to give us the usage data for that. And then we can use this fancy button where we can just rerun the report and do it all over again. Um, it's very handy when you just need something quick for, say, like a research librarian who's looking for a specific usage data for a title. So the key takeaways here in all my analytics, use pivot tables. <laughs> um, the default view or display views, it's a basic table, that's fine. However, you can create a pivot table and make it work for you and have it displayed well. And it, especially if you have to provide that information, you can export the way that it looks as that pivot table. Um, create custom formulas and calculations. If you want to create a column that gives you the average usage or the total usage across certain years, you can do that. Um, you can even rename them to make it sound simple. Instead of saying it TRJ1 journal requests, you can just call it journal usage. And that way it makes sense to everyone that's opening it. And then make time to experiment with analytics. 
again, I spent a significant amount of time experimenting and I still plan to go back and experiment more about what can I do in analytics with this information? What kind of graphs can I make? Even if it's just for myself, it's still a good skill building to know that you can click around in analytics and tell someone else how you were able to do that. Because analytics is very hard to work in and it's still something that a lot of people are hesitant about and they want to know about it. And you can be that person um, that knows how to do that and also know about counter usage. Um, the best lesson I can give to anyone from anything that I've learned is to be patient with the process and don't be critical of yourself if something doesn't seem to be working the way that you think it should. And that is my presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Erica. That was awesome. Thank you. And now we can go ahead and move to Hong Lee, Timothy Goodrich, and Christopher Hawley. OK, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our session. I'm Hong Li, the Electronic Resources and Discovery Librarian at the University of Tennessee at Martin. I will be um, presenting with my co-presenters, uh, co Tim and Christopher. They are both from EBSCO. We are going talking about our experience with the Open Essence um, implementation. Hi all, I'm uh, Tim Goodrich. I joined EBSCO back in 2003 and uh, in my current role um, as an implementation project manager. Um, I think I joined in 2015 maybe, so I'm about seven years in and uh, looking forward to contributing to the presentation. And I'm Christopher Hawley, I'm also at EBSCO. I am our director of software as a service innovation. So I focus on a lot of our different software as a service products, including Open Athens. And we thought it'd be nice to have a variety of folks today, even in a short time here to talk to you about a bunch of different things. We can jump into the agenda. Um, and so first I'm gonna go over uh, some of the basics of what Open Athens is, just to make sure we're all on the same page of, of what it is as a, a authentication product. After that, Lee's gonna talk in more detail about their experiences at UT Martin. And then Tim's gonna finish off talking about some of the um, keys for a successful implementation. So, so as far as Open Athens, I, I think it's important to just lay out a couple key pieces here. It is a single sign-on service and it is a, an identity management um, or access management tool. Um, Open Athens can serve as itself, as its own um, identity management tool in which usernames and passwords are stored within it. In other cases, and as is often the case in universities and colleges, Open Athens serves more as middleware uh, between uh, an identity management system of an institution um, and then the library databases. Um, where it really stands out is that it is fully cloud-based, it's hosted, um, it has some really nice uh, interfaces for the librarians to use to easily allocate which students or faculty sets or groups uh, would be able to access certain databases. So for example, if you just wanted them to access the, the business students to access business databases, you could set up something um, of that sort very easily. There are also some really nice reports and things that come along with it. And both Lee and Tim will talk about some of the details that um, help you uh, make the most of those features. Um, finally, Open Athens is a secure system in that it's using SAML 2.0 uh, to transmit that user data. And so jumping into the next slide, um, the one thing that we'll talk in detail today about is a phased implementation approach. Um, and the nice thing about Open Athens is you don't have to do it in all fell swoop. If you wanna do it all at once, you can. Otherwise, it's very easy to set it up and then start applying it to different systems. So for example, a lot of institutions will set it up with their library services platform like uh, Folio or Alma first. And then after that, they'll add other resources over time and gradually phase that out. And that's what um, Lee and Tim will talk about in more detail. Um, and it does, as if we look at the EBSCO suite of products, it does um, enter in very nicely with Folio, EDS, as you'll hear about today, but it also works with other vendor systems as well. So I'll pass that over to Lee and she'll go into some detail about her experiences at UT Martin. Um, thank you, Christopher, for providing the background information about the open essence. 
The University of Tennessee at Martin is located in the northwest corner of Tennessee and has five regional centers. As a part of the University of Tennessee system, UT Martin is a residential and a state-supported university that grants primarily undergraduate degrees. As of spring 2021, the enrollment of the UT Martin is about 6,700 students. Paul Meek Library is the only library that provides services and resources to the main campus and the regional centers. The library was on CRS for decades and migrated to the Folio Library Services platform in July 2021. EBSCO Discover Service EDS has been its discovery tour for a few years. Prior to Open Essence, the library used Easy Proxy as our authentication system to provide off campus access to over 510,000 electronic resources, including ebooks, e journals, streaming videos, and databases. So, why did we pick up the Open Essence? As part of the easy, uh, as part of the EBSCO folio service, Open Essence was offered to our library when we decided to migrate to the folio platform in the fall of 2020. Given its integration with folio and the EDS, we accepted an offer and made plans for the move from Easy Proxy to Open Essence. After fully migrating to folio last July, we were ready for the switch of our authentication system. On the, other, uh, on the other hand, we wanted to provide new user experience for our patrons in terms of access to electronic resources. Our patrons encountered access issues for several of our main content providers with easy authentication. We also experienced recurring access issues caused by frequent updates and the changes to Windows platform that required URL and the standard change in easy proxy configuration. With Open Essence, we expect to provide the campus community and the distance students in the regional centers with smooth and uninterrupted access to our online resources. Um, here is a, a kind of a timeline for our migration. Our implementation for Open Essence initially started last June, which was the first phase when team was mainly working on the configuration and the refinement of the Open Essence connector. This, this part was related to patron functionality in our new EDS and the photo catalog, including uh, play, uh, placing holes and making requests. We kick off the phase two at the beginning of the fall semester and made lots of preparations in August and September. First of all, I work with our IT staff to complete the Open Essence setup questionnaire which allowed the team to customize our open essence setup to our specifications. I also compiled a list of our subscribed resources and submitted the related information to EBSCO by using the open essence window contact tool. This list included the platforms, a platform names, content hosts, database names, subscribed titles, subscribed IDs, and also URLs. At the same time, I collaborate with Tim to verify that all our windows enabled Open Essence authentication on their end. Tim also helped us finalize, asynchronize the URLs for all our subscribed resources. Making preparations was time consuming, but decisive process that affected the following work. Testing Open Essence and reporting any authentication issues to EBSCO and Windows came next after Tim finished the configuration of the resources in the Open Essence system. This involved verifying access and holdings of our resources on and off campus. Therefore, we keep communication with Windows and the content pro uh, providers back and forth until we ensured that an open essence authentication worked with different platforms. I also made a call for a volunteer tester at our library and asked my coworkers to take a random test 
at their workstation and off campus if possible. Our tests were to verify full text access and site access to our resources. In addition, I updated the proxy citing in libguides to get an A2Z database list authenticated accordingly. We went live with OpenAssens on December 15, 2021, almost in the end of the fall semester. It turned out to be a good time for the transition since it didn't impact the uh, campus community that much in terms of their use of library uh, services and the resources. It also gave us time to promote the new authentication system to the campus at the beginning of the following spring semester. We posted a brief blurb on the library website and created libguides to promote, to, to uh, provide open essence information and the instructions on how to access library resources on and off campus through this new system. In addition, I shared some open essence webinars with the library staff to get them familiar with this new system and also work the staff at the circulation through the whole process and also answer them questions. This could be part of our internal training. So um, what kind of the lessons we learned from this process? As the system, as we all know, any system migration or implementation is a learning process. Our transition to open essence was no exception. So I would like to share a couple of things um, that I learned from our experience. First, having a comprehensive list of vendors and uh, subscriber resources can be key in making the transition work successful and effective. In our case, I worked with the acquisition department to come up with the list. And we found missing and inaccurate information about our customer IDs and also account and numbers. Also, the list of the resources was originally put out of the previous ERM system, which did not include some, some of the required information. So it took me some more time to contact the individual vendors to verify our account information and the subscription numbers. During this process, I also identify some canceled and obsolete resources. In addition, for some resources subscribed through a consortium, we need to figure out which customer number should be used for the open essence configuration. It was also important to make sure that vendors and content providers properly added our, IP, our campus IP range and open essence proxy IP address on their end. For some field authentication to subscribe to e-journals, we realized that the publisher did not update the open essence pro um, proxy IP address as required. Having a basic understanding of proxy and uh, federated res resources was useful as well. Since they function differently, it is helpful to understand how access works for each and how URLs are constructed in open essence when creating links. The other thing I learned about the two types of the resources was sometimes I need to identify which one to select when allocating a resource in open access, open essence admin site, as both exist for a given window. For example, Adam Matthew Digital is such, a pro, uh, such an example. It has both proxied and federated version. Providing appropriate op open essence information to vendor is another thing to keep in mind. For federated resources, the scope information should be verified with vendors. Well, for proxied resources, open essence proxy IP address is a must for all the vendors. Certain vendors have different link linking formats, such as EBSCO, Gale, ProQuest, and Canopy. They do not use the open essence redirector in a URL and have special linking requirements, such as an institution code or some identifier number. For example, the GIL databases need our location ID included in, in the URLs. ProQuest links work the same as GIL, and they do not use the open essence prefix, but include our customer IDs in the URLs. 
Keeping easy proxy aligned with an open essence after the transition for a while was a wise decision we made as we move forward with open essence. Our experience proved it to be necessary to keep easy proxy as a backup authentication. Additionally, giving a large number of mark records with an easy proxy in our system folio, we need more time to work on the replacement of the proxy strings. Creating a shared guest, guest account for community patrons was an, another thing we worked with EBSCO and the campus IT staff to set up for open essence. For the public computers inside the library for walking in patrons, we, it, it, we finally figured out that their ex, external IP addresses were the key to creating a successful IP-based guest account. The last uh, but a helpful thing I learned from our, our move to open essence is to keep track of migration process and the documents, steps, and issues occurring during the whole process for future reference. It is always helpful to take notes for those vendors and the publishers that changed their compatibility with open essence over time. Moving forward, we have several things um, already um, planned for the, uh, for the following semesters. With Open Essence, all of our subscribed resources are managed in one place, which allow us to have a full control of authenticating library licensed resources. It has eliminated the task of managing a local proxy configuration, which was previously handled by the IT staff. We can also directly reach out to our contact point of open essence for any support and assistance when modifying resources in open essence system. The migration of open essence has also changed our workflow for electronic resources management. It involves the process to set up and maintain access, as well as the procedures to troubleshoot, to troubleshoot access issues. For example, our experience with several trial database, databases earlier this semester made us realize the need to adjust our workflow to accommodate the applications of, of Open Essence. Meanwhile, the Open Essence redirector link generator has become an important tool to help us format valid access and resolve some access issues. Updating the existing easy proxy prefix in, um, for electronic resources in Folio is an ongoing project that we have been working with vendors to tweak records as necessary. Hopefully we can collaborate with the Folio team to figure out a way to do a global update for the records in Folio. Also, we need to update our load profiles for electronic resources by replacing the proxy uh, prefix as necessary. In addition, we plan to make use of the reporting function available in Open Essence to generate granular usage statistics for patrons groups and platforms. Because of the integration of Folio and Open Essence, our patron IDs are linked to the electronic resources they access and use through Open Essence. We hope to tally these uh, this data points to patron groups and get a more granular level of usage so that we can identify library resources supportive of student success by analyzing the patterns of usage across our patrons. Overall, I can see Open Essence has offered our patrons a seamless access experience, regardless where, whether they are, they are on campus or off campus. They can log in with their institutional credit credentials on the platform that provide an open essence option to access their resources. They can also start their research, their searches on the library website from where they can connect to the online resources through open essence authentication. And then I turn over to Tim. Thank you, Lee. Nice job. Uh, you've shared all the key elements of UT Martin's Open Athens project, including many of the implementation strategies I highlight on this final slide. Uh, I know time is short, so rather than attempting to cover everything, 
I'll take just two or three minutes to focus narrowly on what has proven to work well in the numerous implementations I've managed um, over the last few years at EBSCO. Uh, first off, it's difficult to overstate the importance of accurately defining the scope of work before the project even kicks off. Uh, the institutions who have an exhaustive list of subscribed resources on day one and who have determined where all their accessing URLs reside across their many systems uh, hit their launch dates with far fewer surprises along the way. Quantifying the number of access URLs that will need to be updated for Open Athens authentication is essential. Having a plan to manually or programmatically convert links and a team identified well in advance to complete the conversion work. Uh, will ensure an orderly process. Uh, the second topic I have to mention is frequent communication with your vendors. Reaching out to content providers and publishers to ask them to configure accounts for Open Athens authentication is a shared task. EBSCO is going to do most of the heavy lifting, but inevitably there will be a significant percentage, maybe 15 or 20 percent, that require customers to either contact them directly or update their accounts via an admin portal. Persistent follow-up with these providers will keep things on schedule and permit EBSCO to complete the configuration of resources in Open Athens early in the life of the project. Uh, this brings me to my third and final piece of advice. Uh, test your new access links as soon as EBSCO provides them and then test them a second time. Then even when you're convinced they're working perfectly, test them one more time. I can say this with absolute confidence and I'm sure Lee and her colleagues at ET Martin will agree the most successful implementations are those that formulate a testing strategy early on. So what does an effective testing plan look like? In my experience, it shares several characteristics. Whenever possible, testing for a given resource is conducted as soon as EBSCO provides the URL. There are multiple individuals, both on and off campus and with distinct user accounts, testing the resource links. Results are well documented, captured in consistent fashion, and shared with EBSCO or the resource provider on a continuous basis. And one final shared characteristic, vendors are pulled into troubleshooting discussions if problems persist. Uh, it's surprising, but quite frequently, as it turns out, the resource provider makes an error in the account configuration. I'll conclude here uh, to allow time for questions, but one final thought on effective implementation strategies for Open Athens, a phased incremental approach that maintains the previous authentication scheme for a period of time after launch, as UT Martin opted to do, provides flexibility and mitigates the risk associated with an abrupt switch to a new system. And I will conclude here. Uh, thank everyone for your time. Um, I guess we can turn it to questions if there's time. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. And we do have a little bit of time left for questions. We've got about eight minutes, so we can probably get through a few. Um, the first question is for Erica. You showed a very simple and aesthetically pleasing report for single journal titles. Was that made in analytics? And can you provide more information on how you made it? Can you repeat the first part of the question? Yes, uh, the person said you showed a very simple and aesthetically pleasing report for single journal titles. Was that made in analytics? And yes. Yes, the <laughs> there we go. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. um, yes, that was um, made in analytics. Um, I did pick our font or like um, our campus colors. That's pretty much how I went about it. And I changed the font size just a little bit. Um, I do have, I think actually I have a little step-by-step -step thing on how that was done. And I'd be happy to share that. I just didn't attach it to the conference um, slides or documents, but you're more than welcome to reach out and um, email me and I'd be happy to show more um, on how to make it super beautiful and fun. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Let's see. The next question is for the Open Athens implementation team. What is something you learned in the implementation phase that surprised you? Um, I would say there were a lot of things right after the, we thought we finished up, uh, finish up everything within the windows. However, it turned out that was not true because different issues may come up at different points. Sometimes my uh, coworkers just uh, like the, 
at a public service, just email me or call me with the questions they noticed or they gotten reports from the patrons. Um, some of them may through the platform and some of them may just because of the, from the specific journal, journal articles. So I just, uh, I always, you know, contact the team. I think, you know, he's a really, he's a really good helper for us. Um, so we kind of work together to figure out what's that an issue on the EBSCO end. I mean, from the open essence, all oh, that wasn't the thing we need to work together with the vendors. Um, so I'm, I cannot give you specific examples because there are a lot of things we are still working on. Um, but to be honest, it's, it's definitely a long-term and also uh, kind of an ongoing process, especially from the learning part. I think probably team also may have something to share with you as well. Yeah, Lee, I think you summarized it well. There are going to be surprises along the way. Um, the idea of an effectively managed project is to kind of minimize those surprises, um, but they do pop up quite often. Um, you may have a resource that um, appears to be working flawlessly and then it may experience some issues that you have to jump in and troubleshoot on short notice. Um, so basically it's, open communication um, between EBSCO and, and uh, UT Martin in this case. And as long as um, you stay on top of any surprises that arise, they, they can usually be resolved within a few minutes. It's just a question of um, expecting the unexpected and, and uh, things will go pretty smoothly from there. Thank you. Looks like we have time for maybe one more question. Erica, you face, Somebody asked, when you phased out R4 reports, were you able to get backdated R5 reports to provide longitudinal data, or did you just switch to R5 moving forward? For the ones that I definitely completely got rid of, yes. I saw some vendors got had their counter five reports pushed back through to 2017. Um, and for the purposes here at Atkins Library, um, that was enough. Um, our collection strategist says um, going back at least three years is good, five years is better. Um, so I definitely got rid of the R4 reports if it hit back to that point. We do have some vendors, I know that we have one vendor that I, they have counter four reports available back to like 2018, but there's no usage that pulls on it. And it's probably because they weren't either using it back at the time or maybe they had a different platform. So for that one, we do have a one release for report with them. Um, it is possible though to try and do a comparison. There's just some formulas that you have to look at um, if you absolutely like need to do that. Um, and it might just be more comparable with the total um, total metric as opposed to a unique metric. Um, but I definitely, as long as I had most of the counter five reports, I got. I just got rid of the R4 because it's not going to be useful at this point. Great, thank you so much. We are at the end of our time and which means we're at the end of the conference. So thank you so much for attending and thank you so much for our presenters for presenting. And just a reminder that we will be sending out recordings and slides in the coming weeks. Um, and if you need anyone's contact information, presenters contact information and want to get in touch with them, that should be in the Whova platform. Please reach out if you have any questions, but I hope you've had a wonderful conference experience. It's been great from my end. Um, and if you are um, a student attending the review resume review clinic, that will start at four. But otherwise, everyone have a great rest of your day and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye all.